This is the first lecture in topic three, which is all about mostly naming and formula writing of compounds. So before we can do that, we have to introduce you to the different types of compounds and mixtures versus compounds and the types of bonding that create compounds. I will say that most of topic three will be review for you. So I'm gonna try to touch on some things that you may be a little bit more advanced or maybe things that you might not remember or might have been confused about the first time that you took chemistry. So it's really important, as usual, that you have completed the learning targets in your notebook before you begin and then that you are ready to add to them as you watch. So please make sure that you stop the video here if you've not already made your learning targets and then go ahead and restart it once you're ready. All right, so hopefully you've made your own notes, you're ready to go on. Let's see what we can add to what you've already set a foundation of as you watch. So before we can start to talk about compounds, we need to compare them to mixtures. Okay, so um, remember that mixtures are two or more elements or compounds, two or more substances that are physically combined and the proportions of the way they're combined are going to be variable. This is something that is not a definite proportion thing. So I can have um, salt water in many different proportions of sodium chloride and water and sometimes I have greater proportions of sodium chloride and then what happens is that the it doesn't all dissolve right so this is um, something that's really important is variable proportions and each of the parts keep the properties that they have so um, there's two different ways we classify mixtures and this would be heterogeneous and homogeneous and what we see here in this picture is a heterogeneous mixture and we know that because we can definitely see different regions that have different composition if i'm looking at the eyeball view of it the macroscopic view of it i would be able to see the iron filings mixed in with the sulfur in this evaporating dish so this is definitely a heterogeneous mixture um, I also know it's a mixture because I'm able to separate it without doing a chemical change. And so in this case, they're using a magnet to pull the iron filings out of the sulfur because the, the iron would be attracted to the magnet and the sulfur crystals would not. A homogeneous mixture is the same as a solution and we cannot see microscopically or at the atomic level um, we would see even distribution and at the macroscopic level we cannot tell that there's more than one thing in there it looks the same throughout so this is a really important note and I know I talked about this before but a homogeneous mixture and a pure substance to your eyeballs appear the same throughout okay so um, notice that what's happening now is that um, we run an iron through this dish over here on the right and nothing is attracted to the magnet, right? So the iron in that dish is definitely stuck to the sulfur atoms in a chemical change, right? So this would be a compound and you can see that this exists in a lattice. This is an ionic compound between iron and sulfide. And so um, you can see that this is a very tight structure very crystalline ordered structure all right so the biggest difference is is that a pure substance like a compound cannot be separated physically but a homogeneous mixture could so if this were just a really evenly mixed mixture of iron and sulfur the magnet would be able to pull the iron out I do want to talk about separating mixtures a little bit um, there's some different ways listed for you here the there were some different ways listed for you in your learning targets there are a few that I want to talk about because they're a little bit more confusing. So you should be good with filtration and manual separation and um, magnetic separation and things like that. But definitely distillation can be a little bit confusing. So I do wanna talk about how it works and when you're on campus, then we will go in and take a field trip to the chemical stock room to show you how the still in there distills water for us. So basically what happens is that you're gonna heat your mixture and this only works if there's a boiling point difference all right, we're looking for a difference in boiling point between the different things in your mixture. And so you'll heat your mixture till it gets to the boiling point of one of the things in there and not the other. So you have to heat it to a certain temperature. And as the first thing that will evaporate starts to evaporate, it, in this case, it looks like it's water. So it's gonna rise up here. 
Um, and we should be able to take the temperature of that vapor and know that it's at the boiling point of what we're trying to collect. And then the vapor comes down this tube and inside this tube, what you can't really see is um, that the there's a tube within a tube in here. It's kind of easier to see right here, but there's this tube inside here and the vapor is going to go inside here, inside this inner tube, okay? And in the outer tube, we have cooled it with water. So what happens is that um, the water comes in and surrounds this inside that outer glass tube and comes back out into the sink. And so we're gonna use cold water for that. And as that happens, that vapor that's in the inner tube condenses and drips out as a liquid, okay? So um, we call what we're collecting the distillate and we collect it in a separate flask. This is a, um, a really easy way to separate like water from salt or whatever. We could use this in desalination, except that it takes a lot of cold water to condense that vapor. So it's not very efficient. And then finally, fractional distillation is just a process. Maybe we have five or six components with boiling points that are all different. We do this and we do it once at the temperature that's the boiling point of the lowest boiling point substance. And we do that until we're pretty much sure that all of that has been collected. And then we raise the temperature to the boiling point of the next substance and do it again until we're pretty much sure that all of that has been collected. And then we raise the temperature to the boiling point of the next substance, etc. They use this in petroleum distillation. Um, so crude oil, as it comes out of the ground, is then distilled into the multiple parts that we use um, for like octane for gasoline and um, you know, we have like kerosene oil and then we have natural gas, et cetera. So this fractional distillation is used to collect the different parts of that petroleum. So the other one that I want to talk about with you is chromatography. And this is to separate um, things that are colored usually and pigments, okay? So the idea would be that um, if you've probably done this in the lab, if you don't really care to collect the different pigments, you just wanna see what pigments are in something, then you can do this very easily on pretty tight filter paper. And you have to choose a solvent, a mobile phase that will dissolve um, the station, like the, the pigments, right? So the solute are your pigments and they have to be soluble in the mobile phase. So they must dissolve. So when we do this in um, first year chem, usually we do it with vis-a-vis uh, -vis overhead markers that are water soluble so that we can just put water in a cup. But then I always ask the question, what if this was a Sharpie? And you'd have to change your solvent, your mobile phase, you would have to change to maybe alcohol or acetone so that it would dissolve the permanent Sharpie marker. And then you have to have a stationary phase that that mobile phase will go through. And the more attracted the solute is to the mobile phase, the faster it flows, the less attracted it is to the stationary phase, and the farther it goes, okay? This is all based on intermolecular forces, uh, the polarity of molecules, their ability to hydrogen bond. And so we will actually do chromatography of purple Kool-Aid once we get to that part of the year so that you can see this happen. Um, what you see here is called column chromatography. And so we can see that we have um, the solvent and we're gonna go ahead and load the stationary phase with what we're trying to separate. And this is just a column of usually um, non-polar substances. And so what happens, or polar substances, depending on what you're trying to separate, but this is a column that the stuff in here doesn't move. And when you um, squeeze it, you push this through, then basically the solvent dissolves this and carries it through. And as it's carried through, these, this purple that we started with here is gonna separate into the pink and the blue pigments. And you can see that the blue pigments definitely, and then also some yellow pigments, um, you can see that the yellow pigments traveled the fastest um, of all those three pigments. And so they would be the most soluble um, in the mobile phase and the least soluble in the stationary phase. And so this is a way that we could actually collect it by using a syringe to do this. So we will do that later this year and you will um, get a feel for how that works. 
So I do want you to try some mixture separation ideas here. So um, actually, I would like you to stop the video and copy these examples into your notebook as examples of mixture separation and then try them yourself and then come back and um, listen and kind of make corrections if you need to. So picture that you would like to separate these and you would like to save both of the components that you're trying to separate. So you wanna get them separated from each other and be able to have each in their own container. Okay, so stop the video here, copy it first, stop the video, and then um, get your answers and then start the video again. Okay, welcome back. So hopefully you have some ideas of how this would work. Um, for a lot of things that are two solids together, we have to choose um, a way to separate them unless one is magnetic, we have to choose a way to separate them where one will dissolve and the other will not. And so you'll see that in the table salt and pepper example, we could add water, the salt would dissolve, the pepper would not, we could filter it, okay? So we'd have to dissolve the salt, filter it so that the pepper stays in the filter paper, rinse the filter paper to make sure that any dissolved salt has gone through, and then we would have to evaporate the water out of the table salt. Okay, if we're not trying to, we don't have water in this mixture right now, so we don't need to try to collect the water, we can just use an open evaporating dish. If we have drinking water contaminated with soot, soot is pretty large particles. This is what's left over um, after a fire burns. It's what you see the black stuff in the smoke. So this would be a grayish colored water and we could filter it. That would stop the soot in the filter paper and let the drinking water go through. But if we wanna, um, that would be it, that should be all, right? So if it's just soot, those are pretty large particles. We can see them, they should get stuck in the filter paper. So that would be good. Um, crushed ice and crushed glass. This would be actually fairly simple. If we're trying to separate the two um, and get ice and glass back, we would actually have to melt the ice, filter it. The crushed glass would be stuck in the filter. We could collect the water from the ice um, in the bottom of a flask and then stick it back in the freezer to get ice again. Uh, table sugar dissolved in ethanol. We could use distillation for this because ethanol will evaporate long before table sugar will. So we could distill this, um, heat it up to the, past, to the boiling point of ethanol. The ethanol would evaporate, run through the condenser and be recollected and the table sugar would stay behind in the flask. And then finally, two pigments from spinach leaves. I could use chromatography. If I'm not trying to collect the pigments, I just need to know what the pigments are. Then I could use a paper chromatography. If I wanna collect the pigments, I would use column chromatography. So hopefully you have a pretty good idea now of how different separation techniques work. All right, I wanna switch gears because we're gonna to switch to bonding now. Um, and so in your learning targets, you can see that the beginning of this was mixtures and now we're gonna to switch to um, compounds and different types of bonds, etc. So remember that we have three types of bonds that you were looking for, ionic, metallic, and covalent. And ionic um, bonds are created between charged particles. They're really attractions, okay? So this is typically between a metal and a non-metal that the metal has lost its electrons to the non-metal when we're talking about ionic bonding. If it's a molecular compound or a covalent bond, this is gonna be between two non-metals and the electrons would be shared. And then metallic bonding is truly all of the um, nuclei of the metal with their core electrons. And then all of the valence electrons of that metal would be shared between all of them, but not like in fixed position, not like a covalent bond where they're attracted just between two nuclei, but rather in um, what we call a sea of electrons kind of surrounding all of the nuclei. So hopefully that helps you understand those a little bit. I do wanna talk about Coulomb's law and introduce you to this because we will use this a lot all year long. So Coulomb's law is the idea that the force of attraction or repulsion, this is force, um, is di direct, and they're calling it energy here in your book, is directly proportional to some constant. So because we're never gonna calculate, you don't care about the constant, times the magnitude of the charges. So this would be like one plus one minus, or perhaps 
2 plus, 2 minus, or um, it could even be like 2 plus, 1 minus. The magnitude of the charges, which means that as those charges um, increase, the force of attraction also increases, and inversely proportional to the distance between the charges. Okay, so the Q's are the charges and R would be the radius of the distance between them. Um, or sometimes you see this as D for distance. But definitely, as we look at Coulomb's law, you should understand that the greater the charges, the stronger the attraction. If the two charges are alike, then like if it's plus and plus, then the greater the repulsion. Um, and the greater the distance, the less the attraction or the repulsion. Okay, so I've got some visuals on here for you, but I definitely want you to see that we can see as melting point as a measure of the strength of the ionic bond, the strength of the attraction, the higher the melting point, the stronger the attraction and the more energy you would have to put in to break the attraction. And so I want you to notice that um, we can compare sodium chloride, which is one plus one minus and sodium fluoride, which is one plus one minus. And we're gonna think like scientists here. So the sodium is the same, which means that um, there's, and the charges are the same. So we're gonna rule out everything that's the same and talk about what's different, okay? So the charges are the same, the sodium ion is the same. The only difference in here is the chloride ion and the fluoride ion. And since they have the same charge, we're worried about size, all right? So on your periodic table, you can see that chlorine has one more energy level. This is all related to electron configurations. Chlorine has one more energy level than fluorine. And so the chloride ion would be larger than the fluoride ion. Okay. So because the distance between the sodium ion and the chloride ion is greater, the attraction is less. And you'll see that sodium chloride has a lower uh, melting point than sodium fluoride where the distance is smaller and the attraction is greater. Okay, so this is the way that you want to think about how this works. We can do kind of the same thing as a comparison. Notice here that now I want to compare NaF and CaO. F and O are almost identical in size. Not quite, but almost. So we're going to say that they are the same size. Um, calcium is larger than sodium because calcium has one more energy level than sodium. Um, and, oh, by the way, calcium is two plus and oxide is two minus, where sodium is one plus and fluoride is one minus, right? So, um, so we have two things going on here. It's a little harder to decide what would happen. The fact that calcium is larger means that you have the larger radius should mean that the force of attraction is smaller. But notice that this is a huge melting point compared to that of sodium fluoride. So clearly the two plus two minus of the charges has a greater difference than the difference in radius between sodium and, and calcium. And so this is how you, you want to think about using Coulomb's law. And we would say that the fluoride ion and the oxide ion are similar in size, that the calcium ion is larger than the sodium ion, so we would expect a, a smaller, lower melting point for calcium oxide, but that it's so much larger is created by then the two plus two minus instead of the one plus one minus. Okay, that's your introduction to Coulomb's law. Hopefully that was helpful. All right, so now we're gonna review a few other little things based on all of this. This should be review for you, ion charges based on the position on the periodic table. Um, this is stuff that you will need to memorize. So I'm just going to go through these with you quickly. Um, sulfide would be S2 minus in this group, this whole group down to the stair steps. Oops, sorry, I'm in the wrong spot. Oh. Sorry, I'm challenged. Um, let me get out of the wrong spot here. So we're going to look at this as so. Oh, no, I was in the right spot. Okay, so this group would be two minus. Um, rubidium, this whole group is one plus. So RB would be one plus. Barium, this whole group is two plus. So barium would be two plus. Strontium is in the same group as barium. It would be two plus. Oxide is in the same group as sulfur. It would be two minus. 
and cesium is in the same group as rubidium, it would be one plus. Um, you should also know that these are one minus as halogens, and this group down to the stair steps will be three minus. You should also know aluminum is three plus, zinc and cadmium are two plus, and silver is one plus. We'll talk about this a little bit more when we go to naming and formula writing. Some other odds and ends and miscellaneous things. You should be able to understand the difference now between a molecule and a formula unit. Um, and when we find the mass of a molecule, we call it molecular mass. And when we find the mass of an ionic compound, formula units are for ionic compounds, then we're really finding what we call the formula mass, not a molecular mass. You can use the word molar mass, and that encompasses everything. So you just have to kind of think about the vocabulary. Remember that molecules exist as discrete little molecules. And so when they separate, they stay molecules, right? So this would be ice, solid water, and liquid water, and water vapor. And the molecule itself um, never separates from itself. If we're talking about an ionic compound, there is no discrete molecule. We don't have that. It's not like that. Okay, and so what you see is that we look at the repeating pattern and figure out the lowest whole number ratio between the repeating pattern. So the formula unit is really the empirical formula of an ionic compound. You have to remember that if I melt sodium chloride, I don't get sodium chloride stuck together still, I get sodium ions and chloride ions moving across each other. And this is why they're so hard to vaporize because the attractions between them are very, very strong compared to the attractions between molecules here. And that's all part of intermolecular forces. All right, so let's look at a couple practice examples of particle level diagrams and ionic and molecular compounds and see what we can come up with. We're going to determine the name, the formula, and the molecular or formula mass of the compound in each of these scenes. So I look at this first picture and see that I have oxygen and sodium. And it appears that for every oxygen, or for every oxygen, there are two sodiums. So I'm going to write the formula as so. This would then be sodium oxide. We'll do naming in a little bit. Um, but it's an ionic compound because it's a metal and a non-metal, so you're not ever telling me how many. And then if I wanted the formula mass of this, I would need 2 times the mass of sodium at 22.99 and 1 times the mass of oxygen at 16. These came from the periodic table. And I could find the formula mass um, of either AMUs or grams per mole if we wanted to call it the molar mass of 61.98, I'm going to call it AMUs as a formula mass. It's a formula mass because this is an ionic compound and this would be a formula unit. Um, if I were looking for molar mass, then I would call it 61.98 grams per mole. Okay, I'm going to do the same with the other half of this question and I can see here that I have nitrogen and oxygen in a one to two ratio and these are discrete little molecules right so this is going to be a molecular mass this is not a crystal um, with a formula unit this is going to be a molecular mass and it would be one times 14.01 for the nitrogen and two times 16 for the oxygen which gives me 46.01 AMUs or as the for, as the molecular mass and 46.01 grams per mole as the molar mass. All right, I'd like you to try this one the same way um, and then restart the video to check yourself. Um, and actually, well, we'll try that. And then um, actually put your answers in the question at the end. All right, I hope this was helpful. Maybe you um, knew all of this already, but I'm hoping there's something that you had that was new.